take your Bible out with me, whether you have it in book form or digital form, and I want you to hold it high in the air. We believe in the Word of God. Amen? We believe in the absolute truth of God's Word. He's not only the way, but He is the truth. So we come under authority of God's Word. I want you to say this with me. This is my Bible, God's Holy Word. I am what it says I am. I will do what it says for me to do. I place myself under the authority of God's word. It says I am blessed, therefore I am blessed. It says I am an overcomer, therefore I overcome. Every obstacle, every challenge, and every hindrance, through the name above every name, Jesus Christ. I open my heart, I open my mind to receive God's word. I receive this word and I confess this word in the name of Jesus, amen. Now take that same Bible and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 22. We're going to look at verses 14 through 20. Today is Communion Sunday. We will take communion before we leave uh, this morning. In Luke 22, verse 14, it records when it came or when the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So he's pointing their outlook forward. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Now, Holy Spirit, open our heart, we pray. Open our minds, open our eyes to see the wondrous, wonderful truths of your word. May this service be like none other, God. May this communion time mark us. Lord, I thank you that you've called us to be your light shining in the darkness. You've called us to be the salt of the earth. We thank you and we love you in Christ's name. Amen. With the Lord's help and the dependence upon the Holy Spirit, I want to take this phrase, do this in remembrance of me, and I want to build our thoughts from it. I want to build this sermon, build this idea upon this idea of remembering Remember me. Remembering Christ. Remembering his life and his sacrifice. Remembering his deeds and his actions. Remembering his love and graciousness. Today is Communion Sunday. As believers in Christ, the act of communion is an important reminder of our relationship with the Lord. It serves as a tangible, as a tangible manifestation of God's grace and mercy in our lives. 
It also can be a powerful source of spiritual renewal. It is a day that we celebrate and remember his life and the offering of his life for mankind. Today we celebrate Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, the bread from heaven, Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We come today to the table of remembrance. To remember is a powerful thing. To remember is to recall the significance of a matter or an event. And in today's society, In order to help us remember events in life, we have memorials. You see this instituted in the Old Testament. The Passover celebration was a memorial of God's delivering the Israelites from Egyptian captivity. For the Lord told Moses in Exodus 12, verse 12, On that night I will pass through the land of Egypt. And I will strike down every firstborn son, firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt. For I, I am the Lord. But the blood on your doorpost will serve as a sign. Marking the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood. Did you get that? When I see the blood, I will pass over You, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. This is a day to remember. Listen what the Lord said to the Israelites. This is a day to remember each year from generation to generation. You must celebrate it as a special festival to the Lord. This is a law for all time. When I see the blood. I will pass over you. It became a memorial. The Israelites, when God was leading them from from the land of the wilderness into the promised land, they were crossing the Jordan River for the final time. Joshua is now their leader. The Lord told the Israelites to gather 12 stones and to build a memorial in the place they would encamp that night. In Joshua chapter 4, verse 1, when it says, When all the people had crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Now choose 12 men, one for each tribe. Tell them, take 12 stones from every place where the priests are standing in the middle of the Jordan. Carry them out and pile them up as a place where you will camp tonight. Verse 6, we will use these stones to build a memorial. In the future, your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? Every time we come to the Lord's table, every time we take communion together, it serves as a memorial. Our children will ask, why are you doing this? Let me tell you, because God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. We're able to tell the story of our own personal exodus out of Egypt, the sin of bondage, the land of bondage, into the promised land, the land of freedom. We're able to describe how Jesus saved us, filled us with his Holy Spirit, how Jesus forgave us of our sins. When you do this, remember me, he said. Memorials are important to a society, reminds us of our history. It reminds us of our past events. And today I want to speak for a few moments on this idea of remembering, remembering our Lord. And when we come to the table of remembrance by participating in communion, we first of all remember his life. He said, remember me. The life of Jesus is precious. Everything about Jesus is precious. His name is precious. It describes who he is. His name shall be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. 
It describes when we remember Christ, we remember who he is. We remember his life. He's Emmanuel. He's God with me. As I take this communion, I realize he's God with me. He's God in flesh. He's God walking with me, talking with me, communing with me. His life, we remember his name. His name was Jesus. You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Yeshua, the Lord who saves. Andrew, as soon as he met the Christ, as soon as he met Jesus, he ran to tell his brother Simon, who Jesus would later rename as Peter. John records it in chapter 1, verse 41. Andrew went, he found his brother Simon and told him, we found the Messiah, which means the Christ. His name reveals who he is. He's the Messiah, the Christ, the one sent, the anointed one. When you remember his life, you don't only remember his name, you remember his mission, why he came. Write that word, mission. Why did he come? He came for you and I. You and I were his mission. Humanity was his mission, souls. This is why Christ came into the world. Paul, letter writing to young Timothy, the pastor of the church of Ephesus, said, this is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst of them. The old English says, I am the chiefest of sinners. This is a trustworthy saying that Christ came into the world to save us. Yeshua, to wipe away our sins that we might have fellowship with God. You remember the words of Jesus? Luke records them in his 19th chapter, verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. See, we remember his mission Remember, he came to seek and to save. Not only to find us, but he had the ability to redeem us. Had the power to change us. Had the power to take us out of that miry clay and to set our feet upon uh, the rock. He had the, ch- the, the, the ability not only to seek us out, not only to find us, but the, the ability to redeem us. See, the word says you're saved to the uttermost. He didn't just find you and leave you in your condition. He found you and changed your condition. How many are thankful today that he changed your condition, that he redeemed you? He came to seek and to save the lost. But what is so powerful about the mission of Christ is it is the same today as it was 2,000 years ago. It's about the one. And I want you to write that, the one. I'm thankful for the masses. I'm thankful for the crowd. I'm thankful for the multitudes. But Jesus is all about the one. He's all about you. You matter to him. You matter to Christ. In John chapter 4, we have a beautiful display of Jesus' seeking out the one. In chapter 4, it says, <clears throat> we see the woman at the well. And he said, I, I've got to go through Samaria. The disciples challenge him, why do you got to go through Samaria. He says, I must go through. There was something compelling him. And we find him coming to the well. And it's there that he begins to have a conversation with an individual, with a lady. And and, and he began to reveal his nature to her. And it's a powerful example of how the Lord seeks out the one. It is also here in the gospel of Matthew chapter 18, verse 12. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Will he not leave the 99 others on the hills and go out to search for the one that is lost? How many can testify to the goodness of God that he found you, that he came searching for you? Aren't you thankful he's willing to leave the 99 and go? Go find the one, the lamb. I'm thankful today for the mission. 
thankful for the life of Christ. Yes, he came for the multitudes. But what begins, and we see the expression, the multitudes begins with the one. This one woman at the well, when Jesus revealed to her her innermost thoughts, her condition, she ran back to town and she told everybody, come see the man. Is he not the Messiah? Come see the man who told me everything about myself. Come see the one who can give you living water. That one became the missionary that that whole city saw who Jesus was. He came for the one so that you might become the light, that you might become the salt, that you might become the answer to the next one and to the next one and to the next one. So that even a city could be turned upside down for the kingdom of heaven because of uh, the one. My hope and my prayer is this, God, do it again. Restore man, seek the lost, deliver the bound. Do it, God, do it again for my family. Do it again for my friends, my co-workers, my community. God, do it again. Reach the hopeless, reach the unreachable, reach the broken, and reach the down and out. God, do it again. See, when you remember his life, you remember his purpose. He came to fulfill the law. He came to do not his own will, but the will of the Father. So often, we get caught up in our own agenda. We get caught up in our own desires. We get caught up in our own will. Sometimes we get caught up in our own plan. But Jesus, as we remember him, we remember his life, we remember that he came not to do his own will, but the will of his Father. Lord, again, show us your will. God, again, lead us in your paths of righteousness. God, again, give us a people, give us individuals who will say, not my will, but thy will be done. God, again, do it in our heart that will die to self, die to our purposes, and will live for the purpose of heaven, will live for the purpose of God, and will live to the destiny of the Lord. It was in that same interaction with the woman at the well The disciples came and were trying to get him to eat, and he says, no. And they're wondering, well, did somebody already bring him something? Did somebody already meet the need? It was here that Jesus said, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. And my hope and my prayer is this, is that God again, will show us where our true nourishment comes from. Doing the will of God. This is seen no greater than the night that Christ was betrayed. He's in the garden among the olive grove. He's asked his disciples to tarry with him and to be with him, to pray with him. But in their own stupor, they cannot. They fall asleep. They become distracted. And it says this. He went a little further and bowed his head to the ground, praying, Father, Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will be done, not mine. Then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, my father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. His purpose was to fulfill the law. His purpose was not his will, but the father's will. And his purpose was to give his life for you. 
remember his life. When we come to the table of remembrance by participating in communion, we second of all remember his miracles. Write that word miracle. We remember the authority he walked in. We remember all the good he accomplished when he performed miracles. He fed the 5,000. He walked on water. He healed the crippled. He delivered the demoniac. He opened the eyes of the blind. He turned water into wine. He calmed the storm. Church, these miracles display the nature and the character of who he is. It revealed his nature. He is the son of God. And he had the power to forgive sin. He has the power to work and move in your life. Let me tell you what these miracles do. When you remember his miracles, it reveals his compassion. He's compassionate toward us. He's compassionate toward mankind. He's compassionate toward humanity. He's compassionate toward you. What are you facing? What are you walking through? I want you to know God has compassion toward you. You're not alone in this. You're not walking by yourself in this. He cares about you. Peter said, cast your care upon him because he cares for you. He's compassionate toward humanity. He's compassionate toward the hurting. He's compassionate toward the forgotten of society. It's so important that you and I understand as we remember He's not some God perched up in heaven millions of light years away. He is a God who is near. He is a God who's compassionate. He is a God who sees you. He's a God that entered into your world so that you may have life. So that you may know that he cares for you. The most precious words of Jesus, Matthew records them in chapter 11 in his gospel. He said, come unto me. All of you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. His miracles reveal his compassion. His miracles reveal his kingdom. His kingdom is not of this world. He could have called 10,000 angels to come and rescue him. But his kingdom was not of this world. It's the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of power, a kingdom of restoration. You remember the questions of John the Baptist. He's been arrested. He's facing execution. And he sends some of his disciples to Jesus to ask him again, are you... Are you the Christ? Are you the one that we're looking for or should we look for another? Matthew 11 verse 2, John the Baptist who was in prison heard about all the things the Messiah was doing. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah or should we keep looking for someone else? Jesus told them, go back, tell John, tell him what you have heard and seen. Notice this, the blind see. The lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. (laughs) These are all elements of uh, the kingdom of heaven. These are all elements of of that new time, that time of the Messiah. These are all elements that every Jewish individual will be looking for. Go tell him the blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the blind are raised, and the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. Hear me today. Jesus revealed not only the heart and the Father, not only to follow the will of God, he revealed the compassionate arm of the Lord. He also reveals to us the power of the kingdom. What are you facing What are you walking through? What impossibility do you feel like you're going through? Remember me. Remember Jesus. Remember his life. Remember his miracles. When we come to the table of remembrance by participating in communion, we remember his work. 
the work of Christ. I thank communion, also known as Eucharist, also known as Holy Communion, Table of Remembrance, the Table of the Lord. When we come, as oft as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. You remember his work. Jesus was rejected by his own people. John in his gospel opens up with that great, that great epilogue as he's beginning to declare who this Jesus is. He says he came to his own people and even they rejected him. We remember his work. He was rejected by his own countrymen. His own friends, they deserted him. They fled. No one stood with him. Mark's account is this. Then all his disciples deserted him and ran away. He was deserted by his own family. They thought he had lost his mind. They taunted him. His own kinsmen, his own countrymen rejected him. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, as he is preaching, in Acts chapter 2, we have that first recorded sermon. And in verse 22, he stands up and says, people of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen. And his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and you killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life. For death could not keep him in its grip. See, they may have rejected him. He may have been rejected by his own countrymen. His disciples may have fled. And with the help of lawless Gentiles, they crucified him by nailing him to the cross. But death could not keep him. Death could not hold him. For God raised him to life. We remember his work. Listen. To Peter's words as they stand before the Jewish council in Acts chapter 4. He said, let me clearly state to all of you and to all people of Israel that he was healed by the power, powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. The man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. <laughs> the man they crucified, but God raised him. From the dead. For this Jesus is the one referred to in scriptures where it says, The stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. Good. We remember his work, his suffering, his death. And as we prepare our hearts for communion today, Jesus said, As oft as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. This is one of the most precious, most holy things that we as followers of Christ can do. The ushers will make their way down front to make sure everyone has the elements. And as they pass you by, if you just raise your hand, if you need the elements, and they'll make sure. Ushers come forward together at once. As you close closely and slowly make your way back to the back, make sure everybody is served today, please. We remember his work. We remember he was rejected. We remember he suffered, suffered for our salvation, suffered for our healing, suffered for our restoration. But 700 years before the birth of Christ, a prophecy was given. Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted 
with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. We thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. He was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be made whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Today we remember his death. Death on the cross, paying the penalty of my sin. Father God, we come today. Before this table of remembrance, this most solemn and sacred day. As we conclude our 21 days of fasting and prayer, we remember. We remember your life. We remember your miracles. We remember your work. Lord, I pray, pray that wherever we find ourselves today, that we'll look up. We'll lift our eyes a little higher. Where does our help come from? Our help comes from the Lord. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord. The Lord of hosts. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord. Strong mighty in battle. Jesus, you came to fight our battle, to face our enemy, and to conquer him who had the power of death. That is the devil. And today, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Today, let the redeemed of the Lord declare today. Let the redeemed of the Lord remember. We remember your life, your miracles, and your work. We stand in your righteousness today as we move forward in this communion be with us precious Holy Spirit Amen can we stand together will you take the first element the bread and hold it with me Paul writing to the church well, Corinth in his first letter, chapter 10. When we bless the cup of the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? When we break the bread, are not we sharing in the body of Christ? And though we are many, we all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. Father, we hold this bread. This bread in our culture and our teaching, God represents the body of our Lord Jesus. 
It's a memorial, a point of reference where we remember that Jesus became flesh. That he was born in Bethlehem. Raised in Nazareth. Baptized by John the Baptist. Began his earthly ministry by being led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness. It was here. It was a prelude of his great victory over the enemy. As he was tempted, he declared, it is written. It was a prelude of that great battle that would take place on a hill called Golgotha. Jesus, the man, fully God, fully man, was the Lamb of God who would take away our sins. We give you thanks for this bread in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take the bread together. Do this in remembrance of me, Jesus. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Let's hold the cup together. Father, this cup represents, symbolizes... Symbolizes all that Christ accomplished. A new covenant between God and his people. A covenant that was confirmed by the death and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For your word says without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. This new covenant is a covenant between God to be our God, we to be your people. That our sins are washed away. This cup reminds us of the sufferings of our Lord, that by his stripes we are healed. His blood that was shed for us was enough. And Lord, I pray. I pray that those who are sick today will be healed. I pray that those who are struggling today will be strengthened. I pray, God, for those who are walking through times of loneliness. As they take this cup, they'll feel the presence, Emmanuel, God with us. And today we celebrate Jesus. Today we remember Jesus. Today we remember his great sacrifice. Bless this cup in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Let us take the cup together. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord.